Can everybody hear me all right? We hear you great. Okay, great. Sorry about that, but I have network now. Uh, I'm at an interesting place. Uh, I'm above Atlas. Not many people get around to this spot here. This is way up on the side of one end of the, of the detector cavern. Just to show you where I'm at, relatively speaking to the rest of the world, way up there is the world. That's where you guys are. So that's the, the top of a shaft. We have two of these enormous access shafts, which we used to lower the components of Atlas uh, and, and to build it. And you can see I'm above it right here. We have our own superconducting magnets, which are inside those cryostat tubes. You can see with the orange straps on them. Uh, and those are used, uh, as, as Mohammed was saying, that those are used actually for the detection of particles. So we need to have superconducting magnets both for the uh, acceleration and, and focusing of the LHC proton beams, as well as for the detection of particles. Uh, so let me, um, let me start off on a good foot here, because I already started off on the other one. Turn around, give you a little introduction. Um, so Isabel, what does everybody know so far? What have they learned? Uh, they've learned that the LHC is 27 kilometers around, but why it's underground and that Atlas is at an intersection point, but we didn't get okay. very far. Okay, well, that's, that's already a pretty good start. So, so, um, so I'm here at Atlas. Atlas is, is a part of the CERN laboratory. Uh, the laboratory has many different bits of physics in it that we're not going to touch on today, but there's a lot of amazing things that have happened here for a long, long time. CERN came about in 1954, after World War II, when we decided it would be a good idea for scientists from around Europe to get together to work on science for peace, as opposed to making bombs uh, to shoot at each other. Uh, and that's turned out to be a really good recipe, because we've continued to do uh, science for peace for a long time now, and we're included people from all over the world uh, to work here at the laboratory. Now, across the street from here, uh, there's a lot of really amazing things. We're studying things like antimatter, antimatter, which seems to have amazingly disappeared after the beginning of time. Uh, Isabel wasn't around uh, at that time. I'm, I'm a little bit older than her. It was about 13.8 billion years ago. And you know, after the Big Bang, matter and antimatter appeared and they all ran into each other. And the weird thing about it is that we're here. So a little bit of dust that remained after the matter and antimatter collided and disappeared, uh, this sort of dust that remains is just matter, it's us. And so we're confused by that. We don't understand why we're here. We're glad to be here, uh, but we don't understand that. So there's, there's a group of people on the other side of the street where the CERN laboratory, most of the buildings are located, who study antimatter. There's a whole facility for that. It's a, it's a complex thing to understand. They're studying everything from whether hydrogen is like hydrogen to whether antimatter falls up. Okay, Every, everything you can imagine to try to understand the differences between the two. That's going on across the street. Also across the street, there's people working on things like isotopes, uh, trying to see if certain isotopes could be useful for medical purposes. Uh, there are some isotopes you can create in a lower energy beam that can uh, decay and emit certain particles, which if you can put them in the right place, could say remove a tumor or things like that. So a lot of things are interesting there, or you can produce different medicines uh, using that. There's a whole different facility over there called ISOL that's also uh, doing that. That stuff's going on across the street. On this side of the street, you've got the LAC, 27 kilometer round, uh, amazing accelerator. Uh, it's incredible that it works as well as it does. It takes protons, zooms them in one direction, protons and zooms them in the other direction. They're right next to each other. So you have to have amazing magnetic fields to be able to do that. And uh, it squeezes the beams and collides them in the middle of the detector. Now that's, that's no easy thing. Uh, uh, what we do actually with the beams, we squeeze them small, very fine, but we also chop them into bunches. So we have these bunches Sounds cute, like a few protons. Actually, a bunch is, is a galaxy of, 
protons, 100 billion protons in a bunch. We pass 100 billion protons through another 100 billion protons. But if we didn't do any other work, just like Andromeda and Milky Way will miss each other when they pass through each other. It's kind of a drag, but it's going to happen in, in you know, a billion years or so. Get ready for that. Uh, all the stars are going to miss each other because there's tons of space out in outer space. Same thing is true uh, in inner space. And so we have to work really hard to squeeze these protons together, 100 billion of them against 100 billion, so that on a good day, we get about 60 or so that collide. Right now, we're working on the LHC to try to get more collisions per second. We call that higher luminosity. But that's what happens in the middle of these detectors. Four detectors, four spots where we pass the beams through each other, Ghostbuster style. We pass them right through each other. And, uh, and then we try to get them to interact. So if you squeeze them enough, you get them to go through each other. It turns out that even when you get these protons to go through each other, you have to do that many, many times before they do it and interact in an interesting way. Okay, so a proton, as you guys all know, it's not just a simple particle, it's not a fundamental particle. It's quarks and gluons. And what we want is for those to get close enough and get to a high enough energy that they will interact and maybe make something new or do different things than what we're used to. So that's what goes on in the middle here. It goes on there, uh, well, 40,000 times a second you're smashing 100 billion against 100 billion. So that's what goes on inside there. And, um, and like I said, when we're lucky, you know, we get some good collisions. We get some things that happen to interact and we can see that out in the outer part of the detector. I'm way up on the top and you can see the detector down, down there. Our goal by doing all this, you might say, Steve, why are you doing all this? Why do we care that these protons come close to each other and interact? Our goal ultimately is simple. It's just to understand what we're made out of. What is the universe made out of? What are the fundamental components? Fundamental components, that means elementary particles. Protons are not elementary particles, but the quarks they're made up of, we think, are. And so we're trying to map out what are the fundamental part, what are the elementary particles? What are the building blocks, the Lego bricks that you can't break anymore uh, of our universe? And then to understand how they interact with each other. What are the rules behind how they interact? That's uh, the model we're trying to understand. We have one, we have a standard model, which is as old as I am, which is amazingly good. It's incredibly good. It's made incredible predictions. Uh, and that's a problem because it's missing a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things we don't understand. For example, gravity isn't in it at all. That's a big problem. So we have that model. We test it. That's mainly what we do is we test it and we look for new things, things which are predicted by the model, but also perhaps for things which are not predicted by the model. That's all that goes on here. That's it. We're trying to do fundamental physics. Um, and this is a great place to do it. Here where we're at, this is the Atlas experiment. If I go all the way through that wall and go all the way across to the other side, uh, you'll find the CMS experiment. That's another experiment which like Atlas is, is enormous, is it large in volume, uh, it's massive, it has, it's very, very complex. Each have like a hundred million uh, channels of information that come out of it. And, uh, and, and these two, they, they, in a sense, we sort of compete with each other, but we also uh, you know, cooperate with each other. It's really essential that you have uh, at least a couple experiments that are, that are looking for things which are similar so we can confirm whether or not the other has, has actually seen something when they think they have. We each have these nice small groups of people who work on them, which is about 3,000 authors, uh, of which Isabel and I are just two of them. Uh, and we also uh, have even, that doesn't even include everybody. There's roughly, there's more than 5,000 people uh, who work on each of these experiments. If I go, that way, or then, I, well, if I go that way, I'll run into a wall and a tube. But if I were able to go through that, I would end up at an experiment called LHCB. LHCB is another experiment at a, at a collision point on the LHC. And over there, their experiment is really focused on trying to understand this, this uh, imbalance between matter and antimatter. They're called LHCB because 
they tend to focus on the particles that contain the B quark because those guys we've measured that they have an asymmetry and that they do sometimes decay more often to matter than antimatter. Not enough to explain the imbalance we see, but that's a clue. So we're trying to follow a clue. These guys focus on it. They've done a lot of amazing things over there, including finding groups of quarks together that we hadn't seen before, pentaquarks and tetraquarks, and lots of different, uh, uh, different particles, uh, composited particles uh, that, we, that we had never measured before. So they're doing a lot of great measurements there. And if I go the other way and I walk down the tunnel the other way, the first experiment I'll get to that way is something called ALICE. The ALICE experiment is amazing because it's designed to look at the collisions of heavy ions instead of protons. Uh, we take lead ions and we pass them through each other. And uh, that gives us a sort of material which is much like just before protons were born. So I was just a little kid at the time. It's less than a second after the Big Bang. Okay, so 13.8 billion years minus a second ago. Uh, that's when there was this sort of primordial soup of quarks and gluons. It was extremely high energy so that these things uh, didn't condense and form into protons and neutrons. It's an amazing thing to study. Their detector is specifically designed to look at that environment. Uh, we also look at that as the lead atlas and at CMS. So those are the things that are going on here. Uh, I'm way up at the top. It's not necessarily so interesting here, except that you have the view looking up to the top and the view going down. So what I'm gonna do with you is take you on a walk and I'm gonna show you uh, this far end of the detector because the detectors on the far end, I find very interesting in part because I helped to work on them, uh, but also because it's, it's what we can see. We can actually go up and touch them. I won't, but we can. And, um, and then I'm gonna take you down so you have a view sort of in between, like I showed you on the map between the end caps and, and, and the barrel part. So let me take you down. And uh, I can answer any, any questions if anyone has them as we walk down. Show you here. Isabel, is there any, do you have any questions there that I can, I can answer we or try? We don't have any questions right now. Um, okay. Oh, we do. How do huh? the detectors control where the protons collide? Ah, very good. So that, that's not the detector job. Fortunately, <laughs> that's not the job of the detectors. That's the job of the accelerator people. They do this with an extremely complex uh, magnet system. Uh, something they have uh, dipoles, quadrupoles, sextipoles. They have a variety of different uh, magnet configurations which can focus the beams and, and, to, and to send them around. So I mean, like the, the basic concepts you have to know in case you want to build an LHC at home, or you need some, you need some room to do that. Uh, you need to know that a charged particle uh, curves in a magnetic field. Okay, that's one of the most basic things. You need to know that to build your accelerator. That allows you to uh, take the beams to accelerate them. You have an electric field that you give it a push, like. Uh, like, like a mother does on a merry-go-round. Fathers do sometimes too, sometimes they push too hard though. Um, you know, you have a merry-go-round, you have your children on it, you give them a push every once in a while. That's what happens on the LHC. We have an electric field which pushes them. And then you have these different magnets which focus them and make them uh, pass through each other. So the beams pass through each other in the center. There isn't actually a, a beam pipe there in the very center. So the, the, so the beams can go straight through each other. The thing is that not many of them collide. That's the trick. So the beam goes all the way around. It goes right through each other and passes around. But over time, the, the beam diminishes because there are collisions. And then eventually we restart after many hours. Let me, let me show you. Uh, I'm in a very interesting place to me. I hope you guys like it too. Um, so this is the far end of the detector. What we use, there's these beautiful tubes here. These are called uh, monitor drift tubes. These are part of the muon spectrometer. And it, the, the, the purpose of this is to detect when a charged particle passes through. Now, because of the way the detector is designed, all the charged particles which are of lower energy or which are lighter, like electrons, uh, they get stopped uh, by calorimetry in the middle. 
but the muons make it through. Muons pass through a lot of material and they make it all the way out here. And they're a charged particle, they're, a, they're an elementary particle. So it's, it's valuable to measure muons. Muons are really great ways to make discoveries, okay? So they, they will come right from the center of the collision, make it all the way out here. So what we do is we surround the whole area with a magnetic field. We make sure that they curve so that, you know, if, if, a, if a charged particle is less energetic, it will curve less, I mean, it'll curve more, excuse me, got that backwards, it will curve more. It's like, uh, I don't know if you guys know race car driving, but in Monaco, they have a Grand Prix where the cars go much slower because there's a lot of curves. You try to make something curve through lower energy. Lower energy things can't go as fast, right? So like, this is more like the Indianapolis 500 where you want them to go faster. Okay, that's why we have to make the LHC so big. That's why we make our detectors so big. So we put magnetic fields, we make the particles curve and go through these detectors. Now, the second thing you have to know to build a detector is something called ionization. So in the middle of these tubes, these, these beautiful tubes here, uh, there's gas. And that gas is called, it's, it's argon CO2. And it's, we choose that gas because uh, it's pretty stable, but also if a charged particle goes through it, it will ionize it, it can knock an electron off. Then what we do is we put a wire in the middle of this tube and we make a high voltage between the, the wire and the tube. And so when the electron comes off, it's attracted to the wire, it gets onto it and it goes to the end to the electronics, which is, you know, which is covered up here, but there's electronics at the very end. And uh, after it's, it's passed through those electronics and then it gets amplified and it gets, the signal gets sent out by knowing the timing information, which we get from other chambers, uh, we then know not only that a charged particle went through one of those tubes, we know which tube, and we also know at what diameter, okay, where, how far away from the wire that particle went through. So our software gets a whole bunch of circles from these interactions of the, of the par charged particle with the chamber, and and the uh, software has to be intelligent like a three-year-old and draw a curve that goes through uh, these circles. So it does dot to dot, it does a nice curve. And that's how we know the trajectory of the particle that came through. So we have layers of these tubes here and there's several of them. This is the one all the way back. We call this our big wheel for obvious reasons. And, uh, and there's another one that's been pushed all the way back. Normally the other one is pushed up against the detector uh, but it's been pushed back here so that we can get access. Now, I'll show you um, how we get access now. I'm gonna take us down a little bit more. The, the one well, amazing, Steve, yeah. I guess, yes. I guess I forgot to say that we were in shutdown right now. There's no beam in the machine right now and there, there oh. won't actually be until next spring. So Steve is not gonna be zapped by the beam and oh. the detector is kind of opened up so you can see more of it than usual. Yeah, thank, thanks for letting me know. It's, I, was, I was a bit worried, it was getting hot and I thought maybe, now there's no, we, um, we only can ever come down here uh, when there's no beam. And in fact, if we try to come in, we try to go through all of the doors uh, to get in here while there's beam, it will turn off the beam. So nobody can be in here. The problem is that when there's beam, you get a lot of high energy photons and neutrons uh, from, that, that would irradiate. And so that's why, that's why when I come down here, I have this, this little dosimeter. It always measures zero because everything's cooled down by now. Uh, but we always wear that because of that. Uh, so we can come down here at, at the winter time when we're not, uh, we don't have beam. And right now we're in a long shutdown, upgrading our detector and upgrading the uh, uh, accelerator. So I'm gonna take you on this nice little walkway. Now you can get a real view of the detector. So you can see from here, you can actually see inside the muon system to the calorimetry. So in the center there, uh, there's scaffolding in front of it, that's the calorimeter. At the very center of that circle <clears throat> uh, is where the beam pipe would go. Uh, but we've taken the beam pipe out. And then I'll show you the other direction here, what's up against the wall are our two big wheels. So this is a view that you might have seen before when you see a picture of the Atlas experiment. Uh, this, is, this is the other big wheel 
here, you'll see that there's these different chambers attached to the tubes. These are special chambers. They're, they're called trigger chambers. They're named after Isabel. No, not really. Uh, they are uh, special chambers which are used to let us know if a particle came through. We have many, many collisions uh, that happen per second. In fact, if you took all the data, you could have almost a petabyte of data per second coming out of here. We can't do that. Uh, we don't have any way to do that. And then we're not interested in it because most of the time when there have been collisions, it's just protons going through each other and deflecting, uh, scattering off each other electromagnetically. We understand all that stuff. We wanna see something interesting that happened. And so when something interesting happens, it means that you'll get a bit of energy in the detector or you might get a muon that comes through here. Every time there's a muon, we take a picture. So when the muon goes through, it goes through these chambers. They are not as precise position-wise, but time-wise, they're nanosecond chambers. And so they will let us know, hey, something came through at this specific time. When these two bunches crossed each other, something came through here, it went through this one and went through that one and went through that one. And so take all the data that, that happened at that specific time and keep it. And so that's, you know, that data is kept for microseconds, plenty of time for us to make a decision and to keep that, uh, to keep that data. And, and then we write it to tape and we, we, keep, uh, we have petabytes of data that we keep uh, each year. So that's how we make a decision. It's just this thing called the trigger. It's extremely important for this type of physics uh, in order, and so we have a variety of different trigger systems. We have actually what we call a menu of different triggers. If there is an event that has a bunch of energy in it, take a picture of it. If it's got some imbalance of energy, take a picture of it. Uh, some theorists will say, hey, you should look for an event that looks like this. So we'll put that into our menu if we think it's reasonable. And, uh, and we'll take pictures when that happens. This whole thing here is an enormous three-dimensional camera that's taking pictures whenever we pull the trigger uh, and say there's something interesting that went through. And because I know you're going to ask this question, we do take some randomly uh, just to make sure we're not missing things and to check the efficiencies of all our triggers. So this, this is the major, the best view I can give you. It really gives you an idea that the, the detector goes way down there, passes all the way up there. It's about 26 meters from the very top of this wheel down to the bottom. It's an enormous detector because as I said, the particles that are interesting to us are more massive. And as a result, when they, uh, when they transform to lighter particles, which is what things do, massive particles become lighter particles. Those lighter particles have a lot of energy that they carry with them. And so they tend to go very, very fast. And we're really set up to try to discover something new. And so we're, we're trying to be as efficient as possible that means that this, this whole detector here, those tubes inside there, this huge 26 meter tall device is lined up with an amazing precision, tens of microns. So that, that's, that's like the thickness of your hair. We can tell you if a muon passed through above your hair or below your hair, one hair, not all of your hair, one hair. That's the precision that you have to have. By doing that, uh, if, there's a new particle to discover, uh, we have a good chance of finding it. So th this is what goes on up here. That's, that's lined up like that. Um, inside, I can't take you, I'd love to. I can just show you the calorimetry. Inside that calorimetry, uh, there are precision tracking chambers. These have uh, a different kind of magnet surrounding them a solenoid, you guys know what a solenoid is, right? A little coil wrapped around it. Uh, it's sort of a traditional magnet on the inside, although it's super conducting a very high field. And that curves the tracks that come out right from the collisions. And they're detected also using ionization, but they use very small, uh, finely grained silicon uh, uh, detectors in order to make measurements. When silicon gets hit by a charged particle, an electron gets freed, and a hole gets made and you can measure that. And silicon's great because it recovers very quickly. And so between each bunch, we can, we can come back and we can use it again. So the center is filled with silicon. 
Most of the data we take comes from the very center of this detector, but I can't show you. Overall, we have over a hundred million channels uh, of information that comes out and more than 80 million of them are inside uh, that, that detector. So I can't take you in there. I'm sorry about that. I am gonna take you for a walk uh, along to the other side. I won't do that right away because it's louder over there. Um, but uh, I'm gonna stick around right here. Maybe what I can do is stop for a second and, and answer some questions. So Isabel, do you have some more questions for me? So there was a question about uh, whether we could detect low energy events like axions, for example, with, with ATLAS. And I, I was suggesting that actually it's pretty hard for us to do low energy stuff because the particles never make it out of our inner detector um, or our calorimeters, they just stop and get stuck. Maybe you could say a little bit more about how two protons, two tiny protons smashing together in the middle of this detector are plowing through or are creating new particles that have enough energy to plow through tons of copper and all of these detectors on the outside and make it right out to these uh, these uh, outer detectors. It's it's a pretty amazing sure. journey. Sure. Yeah. No, I'd love to. I wish we could find axions, but yeah, no. <laughs> but there is a detector that's that that's certain that's designed uh, for that to look for tachyons. Uh, I mean tachyons. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> for axions. Um, uh, so. So yeah, how do what happens in the center here? You know, um, the beginning of time when I was just a kid, thirteen point eight billion years ago, uh, there was a huge amount of energy density. So the Big Bang had an enormous amount of energy density uh, and energy, right? Because everything was there. The whole universe is there in a ball. Okay. When we say we try to look back at the Big Bang to recreate conditions, we're talking about energy density not the energy, right? We're not bringing back all the galaxies together here in Atlas. So high energy to us in high energy physics uh, means we're, we're finding things that we'd never found before. We're going up in high energy, but it's typically, you know, the, 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 the seven TeV we'll get from one of these beams is, is you know, a, a, a couple of mosquitoes flying. Okay? This is not a, not a huge amount of energy for a human being, it's, it's small. But if you can squeeze that into a small enough area, then interesting things can happen. So that's what we hope. Now, at the beginning of time, with that, we had that high energy density, uh, more massive particles could exist. The thing is, what we've learned with our theory and with measurements, really, we learn from measurements and then we have a theory that explains those, is that the most massive things, they will transform to less massive things because they can. They transform to something less massive plus energy, okay? And that, and that just happens. And if, if you can do something, you do it. That's, that's basically quantum mechanics in a nutshell. Whatever you can do, you do. All the things you can do happen. So these more massive particles instantly transform to less massive particles. What remains at the end when everything sort of cools down are the least massive particles. We're made up simply of the lightest things, up quarks, down quarks uh, and, and electrons, let's say. There's also other things in there like gluons, but that's, that's basically it. That's all you need, right? The more massive things we've learned about over time, we learned about them from cosmic rays, for example, muons come all the way down from interactions. The LHC is happening in our upper atmosphere. Like Mother Nature has done the LHC about, you know, I don't know, 10,000 times in the past at least, okay? because there's high charged particles, high energy charged particles that hit our upper atmosphere all the time. And these collisions happen. And we saw that, we saw the different particles coming from that. And we said, look at if we can control that and do that here with a detector, uh, we'll, we'll be able to measure, do better measurements. So that's what we're doing here. We're, we're, con we're doing controlled collisions in the center so we can make the measurements. So what we hope to do, if you, as I said, the more massive things will transform instantly to less massive things plus energy. Well, it's also the case that if you take energy and add it to less massive things, then you can create more massive things. And so that's what we're doing here with the LHC. We're taking these, the, the least massive things, up quarks and down quarks, and electrons, 
without the electrons actually, of course, and down quarks and, and, and gluons and accelerating them, giving them energy so that when they interact with each other, they can produce these more massive things. And that's what happens in the center here. So for example, I'll give you the example of the Higgs boson because it's one that we all know and love, right? That was something we were looking for. We didn't even know what mass it would have, uh, but it was extremely important to our model to understand how particles get mass. So when we make a collision, typically to make a Higgs boson, it's interesting is that it's not the up quarks and down quarks, but usually the gluons that hold them together, that hold the strong force that hold together photons, uh, interact with each other. And when they interact, they can form a Higgs boson. Our, our model says that, that they're allowed, and it's not that they read the model to know what they're allowed to do. That's what we've measured. So the gluons form a Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is pretty massive, 125. GeV, which is a lot for fundamental particle. And so it will transform instantly to something less massive. In this case, it transformed, for example, uh, to Z bosons or Z bosons, depends you know, where, you're, where you're at. Uh, and those bosons are also somewhat massive, something like 90 GeV. So they're, they're less massive than a Higgs, but they also transform instantly to other particles. And typically there can be electrons and muons that, that we can see that are less massive. And so that's what happened in the center. When we, when we found Higgs bosons, what happens is the Higgs boson got produced in the center. I shouldn't say created. I think we have an agreement with the Vatican that they do the creation, we do the production, right? So they're produced in the center there. And uh, the Higgs bosons then transform instantly to something less massive, Z bosons which then transform into electrons or muons, those particles can make it out. But they have a lot of energy because they came from something more massive. So the mass, the MC squared becomes E. And that's a lot of energy that they have. The less massive things have that energy and they come out. The electrons, typically we measure those on the inside in the tracking part of the detector. And then they get to the calorimetry and they get stopped. They're, they're not so energetic, they can make it through. There's a lot of dense material in there. And we use, uh, in this case, the liquid argon usually stops in something pretty dense with detector components inside there. We have scintillators and other detector components inside the, the calorimeters, uh, which then we measure and we know that, hey, a particle came in here, it left this amount of energy. That means it had this amount of energy. So we measure the energy, we measure the momentum of those particles that come out. The muons, they make it all the way through the calorimetry because they're amazing. They're, they're more massive and they can come all the way out and they'll come out here to the detector. Other collisions, other types of collisions will produce other particles and we'll identify them by the calorimetry, by the, the tracking system and by the muon system out here. So that's sort of how the detector works as different layers uh, of detectors, which, which can measure different particles different properties of the particles. We need to reconstruct all of those things, look at how much energy we have, and then reconstruct back to what happened in the center. Our whole goal is to figure out what happened at the center of that detector. That's our goal. So that may, maybe that uh, gives a view of what's on, on the inside there, even if I can't take you inside there myself. Okay, we have a bunch of questions about um, whether we can compress space time at the LHC. Um, huh? That's a good question. I, I, <laughs> Did you want to approach that one, Isabel? Uh, we, we, we've got some uh, answers going in the chat. We, we, we do look for some interesting effects of gravity and extra dimensions at Atlas, which yeah. is sort of related to that question. Sure. Um, and then there was a question about uh, whether we're doing mostly searches for new particles or confirming uh, the existence of, of already discovered ones or doing measurements and what we're actually looking for now. Okay, that, that, that's, that's the heart and soul of it, right? Um, so that's, those are great questions. Um, we look for everything, right? We got a beautiful new detector here. 
Uh, when we start up again, by the way, the reason we're shut down, this is planned. Periodically, we shut down. We upgrade the accelerator. The accelerator is going to give us a higher rate of collisions when it comes back on next year. And it's also going to probably go up a little bit in energy, up to 70 EV per beam. So that's what's going to happen next year. And that's really interesting for us, but it's a challenge because having more data per second is a challenge for the detector. It's a challenge uh, for the trigger system. It's a challenge for the software. It's a challenge everywhere. And that's why the detectors have to revamp things. When you, you can't, you probably noticed, you said, Steve, you know, that looks great, that view you're showing me, but where's the small wheel? The, the small wheel is one of the, the uh, one of the muon systems there's usually a small wheel inside there and then there's two big wheels to measure three points on a curve and the small wheel is getting replaced we're, we're working on that that's something that's going to um that's going to uh allow us to 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 uh have faster detection on the inside when we get this higher rate of data it's gonna be very important so now why are we doing all this stuff we're doing all this this upgrade because Having more data gives us better statistics. Statistics means that it improves the precision of our measurements. The way our science advances is uh, we measure stuff, right? And we, we, we count, basically we're people who count. We see how many times when we have a gazillion collisions, how many billion of them are producing, are, are doing a certain thing, how many billion look, come out looking a different way, and we count all these different types of things that are produced. And these gives us sort of probabilities. We work backwards. We know how much went in. We know the numerator, how much came out. And we calculate and we get a probability, it's a probability that certain things are produced. We don't know event by event if we're gonna produce a Higgs boson. But we know statistically, if we have this many events, how many Higgs bosons will produce and then of course we verify that, we measure that, and we see how many did we produce. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's the game that we play. So, so we first do the measurements, we look at nature, find patterns, find these probabilities, right? Report them back. Theorists look at this and they say, well, if that's what you're seeing, that fits very well with a model that predicts you know, this. And so we listen to them if they're giving us a prediction that something we can measure. Because again, we go back and forth with this. Now, to answer your question, we do all of those things, mainly perhaps from the best ways to make a discovery is to measure the model that you have. And we have a model that's as old as I am, amazing, amazing model. It's predicted, it predicted the Higgs boson. It predicted the top four so well that nobody actually got a Nobel Prize that I know of for actually detecting it. Okay, that, that, this is pretty amazing. It's a fundamental particle to discover, but we knew exactly what its mass was gonna be. We knew what its charge was gonna be. We knew all of its properties uh, before we even found it. So this model is, is incredibly good. And we, we, we predicted many of the things that, that we've seen. And, and, and so the way we go forward is by measuring the hell out of that model, measuring it as precisely as we possibly can, and hoping that we find something that disagrees with the model. Okay, so we want to find data that disagrees with the model. We're we're uh, we're anti-politicians, let's call it. Not that we don't like politicians, in case anybody there is a politician, but we're not looking for data to support our theory. We're interested in data that contradicts our theory because it's that data um, that allows us, sorry, did I go away from you? There we go. Uh, it's that data that allows us to come up with new theories. And so we really would like to find that. Um, what's uh, our current status is that, you know, we have this wonderful model that says great, but it's missing a lot. There's no gravity in it. We have no clue how to handle gravity at a microscopic level. The real problem we face with gravity is, is its difference in strength between it and the other forces that we know. 
So compared to electromagnetism at the level of quarks and gluons, gravity is so much weaker. It, it, it's, it's hard to express it. It's a million, 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 million times, and then some weaker than electromagnetism. So it, it's a real challenge to try to find a model that will fit that in. And, and as Isabel mentioned, this idea of extra dimensions came about to try to solve that. Perhaps there's extra dimensions, gravity lives in those dimensions. We are only seeing a residual bit of the gravity in our electromagnetic world. So there's questions like that, which are there. So we really, we look for everything. We measure the model as precisely as we possibly can. Good examples of that were in the news last week, the G minus two, you look for experiments like that, or some results that came from LHCB, which show some variations from the standard model, which start to get interesting. Um, but also if something comes about that we weren't expecting, that's great too. Uh, and so we're looking for something that's new as well. I hope that answered that. So I guess we're, we're getting close to the end. Um, maybe you could talk just a little bit about the, the different parts of the detector, because we had a question about uh, wouldn't the, the calorimeters and tracking systems cause the particles to lose energy and change the results. Oh, so okay. maybe you could talk, talk a little bit about how the detector works. Let me talk about that and take you on a walk so you can see how, how, how long this thing is, because uh, you're, you're in a lucky place here. People who actually come to visit only get to be here. They don't get to go through here. So I'm gonna take you through uh, our detector. Uh, and uh, as I said, I won't be able to show you those detector components. I can show you their cables. Uh, there's a lot of cables here, a lot of ties. We're even, as you can see, we're LGBTQ friendly here. We have a lot of different colors in our cables. And, um, and you have to have gas lines and everything to go back inside there. So inside there, these are the muon systems. Inside those three layers of muons, then you get to the calorimetry. So it's true that the calorimeter will affect the trajectory of particles, um, but its goal is to actually stop all the particles except for the muons. And when a muon goes through, it leaves a trace so we can actually track it through. And, uh, and it doesn't really get scattered too much. It takes a lot to scatter a muon. In fact, muons are why this detector is built the way it is. Atlas is the largest volume of the detectors. And it's because of these magnets we have here. We surround our muon system with magnets. In this case, um, we chose a toroidal magnet system. That's complicated. It's very hard to build. It's hard to write the software. Everything about it is complex. But if you, fill, if you have a solenoid around here, then you have a magnetic field that has to go through and has to come back. That's what CMS has. And you can see a really nice S shape to the curves of their muons that go through it. What that means though, is that there's a lot of material. And so the muons that are measured after they've gone through all that material don't as precisely tell you what happened in the center. Atlas, by choosing a toroidal magnet, doesn't have to return its field. It doesn't have to have a lot of material on the inside. So there's less material in Atlas. We're lighter, we're half as, as massive, uh, something like 700 tons, very light, um, compared to CMS. Uh, but as a result, we think we can detect new uh, particles with the muon system uh, more efficiently than they can. It's very interesting. The two experiments are very complementary. Uh, and, and do different types of physics uh, because of their strengths and, and, and weaknesses. I just wanted to show you here, uh, this is what a, a small wheel looks like. This is one of the old small wheels uh, right here uh, before we, we take it out. So it gives you an idea how big this place is. It's 46 meters from one end to the other, it's half of a football uh, field from one end to the other. Any other? Uh, questions uh, that I can uh, answer on the detector or anything? Uh, there was a question about where you're located. So I, I guess I forgot to say at the beginning that this is on the border between France and Switzerland near Geneva. Um, exactly. I just said you were underground. I'm underground. I'm oh. on the third, the third planet. 
uh, of, our, of our solar system, uh, Earth, and in, in, in a continent called Europe, uh, located uh, near Geneva, Switzerland. Geneva is a small place, actually, a few hundred thousand people. Uh, on the, and, and CERN is just on the border of Switzerland. And here I'm in Switzerland, but you know, in 10 minutes I'll be in France going home. Uh, so, so that's where we're located geographically. And then I'm uh, you know, some 80 meters uh, under the surface uh, at point one of the LHC. It has four points uh, where there are uh, beams passing through each other and where there are detectors to see what happens when the beams pass through each other. We're just, just, and then just we, to, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, we had a question about how much it would cost to uh, build one of these at home. Build one at home. Do, do you remember the cost? It's, it's, uh, it's something like half a billion, is that right? Technically, uh, yeah. So that's that's European costing where you don't have to pay anyone's salary, I think. So that's the <laughs> cost of, of buying the parts for it. So if you have a lot of friends to help you with it at home, then mm -hmm. then half a billion is about right. If you have to pay all the people, then it's it's more. Um, our, we can give them, another... for example, there'll be some small wheels for sale cheap soon. Uh... <laughs> right, as a starter kit. And yeah. then the question is, are there other projects like this or is this the only one? Well, of, for the accelerator, the LHC is the only one at this high energy at the moment. Uh, for the detectors, of course, there's the four, as I said, there's Atlas, CMS at the other end of the ring, um, and uh, LHCB, which is that way, and Alice, which is, which is down there. Those four major experiments on the LHC. And there's a few other smaller experiments at the far ends of the detectors to look for very specific things. They're less, uh, less expensive uh, and, and smaller experiments, but also very interesting here. We're, we're looking in right now to the future. We always have to look to the future because it takes so long to design and to build new accelerators. Uh, and it's a worldwide effort. So we recently had a, a strategy update for particle physics in Europe and this, this, this strategy also pertains to the whole world. It's going on also in the US now. Um, uh, where we figure out what's next. And the most likely scenario, it's hard to say, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of debate still, um, is possible that we're gonna build a ring uh, bigger than the LHC, uh, up to a hundred kilometers around, uh, which would allow us to do much, much more physics, a higher energy, look at the collisions of electrons and positrons, and then look at proton collisions at very, very high energies uh, because it helps us get a little bit closer to understanding uh, more in depth. The higher the energy, an interesting equation, E equals H nu tells you that the higher the energy, the, the um, higher the frequency or the smaller the wavelength, so the more you can probe deep inside matter. I can turn this on there. Answer any other questions before uh, I'll have to go too. It seems I'm gonna, I'll probably run out of batteries soon. Just to, to let you know. So Steve, I, I think we, we've probably come to the end. I mean, there, there are questions. We'll try to answer them in the in the master classes tomorrow if we don't get to them today. But we'd just okay. like to really thank you for, for showing us around Atlas. And, and uh, this is actually a very hard view to get in, in real life. Yeah, I'm really happy that you guys asked me to do this because I get to come down here. I love coming down here to, to, to see things. So thank you for joining. Enjoy the master class. Have a great weekend. And, uh, and I'm glad to hear, by the way, that North Carolina has joined the West Coast. That, that surprised me, but I think it's, it's a good idea. Things are strange. We're super enough. happy to have them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you again for joining. Enjoy, enjoy the master class and, um, and have a lot of fun. Thank you, Thanks Steve. a lot, Steve. I'm definitely jealous that you got to go down one day. <laughs> Bye uh, for now. Bye-bye.